it's been a couple of weeks now since I pressed these wines and now the sediment has settled. They're kind of not active anymore. Uh, so the, the fermentation has died down and it's time to rack them, do the first racking, which means pouring the wine off of the sediment in the bottom. And so that's what I've been doing. I've got the, the Nouveau type that I did the semi-carbonic maceration with um, that is made out of um, Frontenac grapes and a couple other, like small amounts of a couple other varieties that I have, but mostly Frontenac. I've got a Burgundy type that is made out of Foch and Malot, mostly a couple of other uh, small amounts of other varieties in there. And um, that one is sort of going to undergo a, a typical fermentation. I also added um, mallow lactic culture to it so that that will uh, convert the malic acid into lactic acid and kind of give it a smooth buttery flavor. And that's already been done and so it's been um, just sitting in the carboy settling out and now I'm racking it. And that one I'm eventually going to put some oak chips into so that it'll have an oaky flavor. The Nouveau wine that I'm making, I don't, I won't put any oak in there. It's just the sort of uh, fruity flavor of the grapes that make that uh, wine taste good. So something that I like to do at this stage of the winemaking process is put the wine into a carboy and only fill it up part way. And that'll leave enough room in there to slosh the wine around. And the idea of this is I'm shaking it up and I'm trying to get the wine to release any gases that are trapped in the liquid. And uh, sometimes you can have sulfur, you can have other things that are trapped in the wine that will add off flavors to it. So I had last year I had this happen. Um, I had pressed some grapes and was noticing a real sulfur smell and uh, that's sort of an indication of something going wrong. But all I had to do was uh, aerate the wine like this and most of the sulfur flavor went out of it. And by the time uh, it got around to uh, being fully aged, none of the sulfur flavor was left in it. You can see how that would be bad. There's also a lot of other gases and things that might end up in solution. And so this will help to, to get those out. So I'm gonna just do this for like maybe five minutes or so and make sure that all the gas is out of the solution. You can really feel the, uh, the gas building up in there and then when I take my hand off, it's sort of like taking the top off of a bottle of pop. It's got a really nice color. I added that pectic enzyme pretty early on that helps it to extract a lot more of the color and the tannins and the flavors. It smells really good. It's been a couple of weeks for this wine to be fermenting and the fermentation, the primary and the secondary have, have slowed down and now it's not bubbling anymore. And the, the sediment has sort of settled in the bottom. And so what we're gonna do is the first racking. This is a Concord type and I've got a about three different batches that I did of Concord type grapes, one of which was Concord, another one which came from uh, the area where I grew up and is sort of a wild descendant of Concord, and then Steuben and Fredonia are the other varieties. I'm gonna mix all those batches together because they're all the same kind of wine, like a sweet, uh, grape juicy flavored wine. Um, but we're gonna do the first racking today. Uh, I will be uh, probably, you know, it'll be one racking after another. I'll wait a couple of weeks, keep on racking it until it gets pretty clear. And, uh, and I'm going to also do a cold stabilization for that. I don't know if I'm going to do that in my fridge or if I'm going to wait for it to happen over the winter. I don't think I'm going to be around over the winter that much. So I might want to just do it in my fridge. The cold stabilization 
will uh, precipitate out some of the acids and they'll end up as, as crystals in the bottom of the wine and then I'll rack the wine off of those crystals so it'll reduce the acidity somewhat and uh, that's kind of useful with this kind of wine because these grapes tend to be pretty acidic. Obviously sanitation is pretty important for this process uh, so I make sure to sterilize everything, the carboy, the transfer tubing and everything to keep things clean because that can be a big uh, factor in how your wine tastes. Another thing that I'm doing while I'm doing this racking is adding potassium metabisulfite. That's sort of a preservative. It also reacts with things in the wine and uh, becomes something completely different. And it basically, in time, it disappears from the wine. The only time you have to worry about sulfites is around the time that you're bottling. And so I try to use a minimum amount of sulfites when I'm bottling um, because uh, with this process, the sulfites, you know, I've been adding uh, sulfites at various times. So, like initially I added them to sort of uh, somewhat sterilize, kill off some of the wild yeast to give the, the yeast that I inoculated the wine with initially sort of a head start. And then um, now with the racking, you add the sulfites to keep uh, the wine from spoiling or getting off flavors to it. Usually the dosage that I use for uh, wine is a quarter of a teaspoon of potassium meta bisulfite powder dissolved in just a little bit of water and then I pour it in here. So it's a very small amount of sulfites and uh, you know depending on what the risk is of contamination or spoilage you might want to add more or less. I try to sort of gradually tail off the amount of sulfites that I'm adding so once I get to bottling there's really not much in there. Just a little history of the Bay Grape which is the one that this wine was made out of. It's Concord type and it's just one of many different wild relatives of Concord that grow where I grew up uh, in Ohio and it's just a, a wild one that I, I took cuttings of and I named it myself. But um, it's interesting because I used to go into the woods when I was a kid and collect these grapes and eat them. Uh, slip skin, they're delicious, you know, very grape juice flavored grapes. And uh, they were descendants from wild grapes that grew there, uh, you know, decades, you know, 50 years or so before I lived in that area. And even you could still see the furrows from where the rows and the vineyards used to be in the wooded area down the street that used to be all vineyard and pretty much everything used to be vineyard there right along Lake Erie. Finding those grapes growing wild and they were so big and had these huge clusters of grapes it was like part of my inspiration for um, wanting to grow grapes when I was older. I grew grapes as a kid as well. I took some, uh, some of those grapes and dug them up and brought them to my house and grew them at my house. But then when I was older, I took cuttings and, and I've kept those cuttings going and now I have some in my vineyard. So it's a little piece of my childhood growing in my vineyard, the flavor of these grapes. I think they're more disease resistant than Concord are because they're just sort of grow, they grew wild and adapted on their own because they were probably from seeds of Concord. As a little kid, I remember going down to the end of the street and harvesting these grapes, tons of them, and not really knowing what to do with them. Um, 
because the kind that we got in the store were all uh, uh, seedless and they you could eat the skins. And so these ones had seeds and they had slip skins. So they were a completely different animal. But uh, one time we tried having a little lemonade stand, kind of grape stand, farmer's market at the end of the street. Nobody was interested in buying the grapes because nobody knew how to eat conquered grapes. They're mostly, I mean, they're really grown for juice. They're good to eat out of hand. They're much better in flavor than anything you'd find in a grocery store. Uh, but they're just a little harder to eat. Apparently, people used to eat them and just eat the skins and the seeds and not be so concerned with them, but I grew up on seedless grapes and so I was pretty spoiled. And I think most Americans these days are pretty spoiled and, and don't know what they're missing because they're afraid of seeds. Listening to an 80s mix. I'm going to be posting some great videos pretty soon about different projects at Dancing Rabbit, a wood gasifier, and tours of a couple of natural buildings. So click the subscribe button below to get video updates. And don't forget to share and give a thumbs up to the video. And I'll see you next time.